Here we go. All right. And I hope this is... Let me see if this is recording. Oh, it is recording. Okay. So, here we go. Welcome. Um, let me get my... clicker here. Okay. So, hopefully... For the students who are watching over the internet, you can uh, see everything, I hope. It's kind of an experiment. And for all of you... Um, oh, look, now it's doing what it's supposed and to do. And the blue yeah. pushed back. Yeah, the blue pushed back, now this is moving. Okay, so this is good. It's, it's doing something. It's kind of going pretty slow, though, isn't it? Maybe because it needed some time to yeah, eat up the rest yeah. of the water. Oh, you know what? I can actually see it. The blue is yeah. going down that way, too. Maybe it needs more dye, actually. I kind of wonder. More dye. circulation in the uh, oceans. Okay. So am I forgetting anything? Everything's good, right? Not. We should turn some lights off. But um, maybe I'll just... No, that doesn't look good. What about... Then you can't see the board really very well like that. Okay. <laughs> Turn them all off. But then I'm afraid this person this person can't see me yet. Well I hope I don't know. I I hope it's recording the screen, but anyway. Whatever. Are you all, can you all see well enough to write your stuff? No? Gilbert, yeah. So let's open the window. Yeah, yeah open the window. Yeah, 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 Okay, that's good. That's good. So it's circulation based on the. So you could imagine if you had water at the equator, right? This is like, let's say this is the equator, and, and that's the, the pole. You can see, right, how it's, how it's circulating. Then the surface water, so the surface water from the equator is moving that way, right? The polar water, and that actually does happen, so you'll see that when you study circulation. Circulation motion. So anyway, let's do this because we got a lot of stuff to talk about today, actually. It's, all, it's like a crash course through weather. So, um, really quick, we'll just go, what's the atmosphere? So, you gotta know what the atmosphere is, because all the, the weather and all the winds and all the circulation in the atmosphere, that's what we're talking about today, and what the heck is the atmosphere? So you gotta know that, first of all. So that atmosphere is the first, first shell of our Earth, right? It's the outermost shell that covers the Earth, and it's the gaseous layer. So it's a low density gas layer that covers the Earth. Okay. And uh, we have differences between climate and weather. So all weather occurs in, you know, the atmosphere, and all climate. All, climate so. all, uh, all weather, of course, is happening in our atmosphere. And then, uh, but what's the difference between weather and climate? So weather is just kind of the, you know, normal day-to-day -day processes that happen, right? So it's sunny, it's cloudy, it's rainy today. You know? And but climate is kind of like those long-term weather patterns. Right, those long-term weather patterns. So, you know, a place might be always dry or always wet or always hot or always cold, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now, this is an important one, so you want to answer some of your questions. Okay. So, what's the what's the atmosphere made of? Right. So, the the, the atmosphere is made of um, nitrogen and oxygen. It's so almost almost like 99% of it. 
so the two gaps. And then the third gap that's kind of pretty rare, but it's around is argon. Whoever thinks of argon? Probably didn't even know it was in there, right? But it's actually 1% of what you're, you know, you're breathing in every day is argon. So. It doesn't really matter very much. It's, a, it's one of those noble gases. Remember, it's an inert gas, so it doesn't, doesn't really do anything. It's kind of an but, but, um, I guess it's kind of fun because you can fill up balloons with argon and then they sink like lead right, because it's such a heavy gas. So. I guess that's, that's fun. Anyway, um, there you are. Oxygen, nitrogen, argon. Actually, most of it's nitrogen. Now, those are the non variable, we call them non variable components because they don't change. Okay. But then we have a component that changes a lot that's very important, that's water vapor. Water vapor. Water vapor is very, very, very important. And you can see that it controls so much of what happens in the atmosphere. And it really, really controls so much. It's kind of the, one of the most, I don't know, maybe it's the most important component. And I guess oxygen is the most important component, we need that. But, but uh, it makes a, makes a big difference in our weather, it's just water vapor. Okay, So water vapor can be anywhere from 0 to 4%. So that's a variable component because it just depends on the weather. You know, sometimes it's really high, and that's when it feels sticky and humid and awful. And then sometimes it's really low, and it feels nice outside. Walk outside, you don't feel like a sauna. You know? It's a nice day. So right now, right now is time. Good. I like that. So anyway, so if you go to the Atacama Desert, it's the driest place on Earth. That's in Chile. Going to find pretty low humidity, right? Pretty low water vapor. And if you go to Costa Rica and go to one of their cloud forests or rainforests, you find quite the opposite. It's really humid, right? A lot of water vapor in there. Uh, you can actually, now what you see here, you see how you can see the fog there? Sometimes people think of that as water vapor. It's actually not water vapor at all. Clouds are not water vapor at all. I know it's kind of a weird thing, but whenever you see clouds or fog, you're actually, you're not looking at vapor. You're not looking at a gas. You're actually looking at a liquid. So, so all this, this is actually liquid water. It's just the droplets are so small they're suspended in the atmosphere. Much like if you threw wood ash up into the atmosphere, it would kind of float, right? It would float around. So it's a, and like smoke too. Smoke is actually made of little particulates, right? Um, so same thing with this stuff. This is this is actually liquid water. You see, but I just show that because it's hard to visualize water vapor because it's invisible. I just kind of want to make that clear that that's actually not water vapor that you're looking at. You look at a cloud or something. Okay. So here's the atmosphere. It's made up of these, uh, just this gaseous envelope surrounding Earth. And it has these kind of concentric layers to it. I'm going to talk about it really quick. Um, so there are different layers of the atmosphere. There's the um, troposphere, that's the bottom one. And that's really all we're going to talk about in this class. Okay. If we studied Earth science, we'd talk about these other layers. But in, the, in this class, we're really only interested in wind and weather patterns and things that affect the ocean. So we're only going to talk about the troposphere. Okay. So the troposphere is that bottommost layer of the atmosphere. There's another one called the stratosphere, the mesosphere, and the thermosphere. It's above it. You don't need to worry about those. Okay. Oh, look at this thing's really going now. Oh, look at that. Oh, and then you see, oh, look at all the blue water is all inundated there. And this is all, I don't know if they probably can't see it on the camera, but. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Oh yeah, I'm happy now. Okay, good. So um, another thing you got to know here is uh, about density of the atmosphere. So maybe you know this. Uh, yeah, it's kind of hard here in South Texas because you don't really have any mountains. You know? And uh, unless you go to San Antonio, we have little So some of you don't have, maybe some, I don't know, have, have many of you gone up into the mountains? Some of you have, right? Maybe you know, if you go really high into the mountains, you might know that it gets a little bit harder to breathe. Yeah. You get winded more quickly. Yeah. Some people, like it's Olympic runners and athletes, they'll go train in the mountains so that they, when they come down, you know, they got more power because it's, it's, uh, it's harder to breathe up there. And the, the reason it's harder to breathe is that the density of the air is less. So the density goes down with altitude goes down with elevation. Okay. 
By the way, just to let you know, I kind of use altitude and elevation, sort of, you know, like synonyms in this class. So if I say it changes with altitude, it changes with elevation. Okay. So there's your your strata uh, or your uh, column of air, and you can see that it's changing, changing with density, or uh, the density is changing with altitude. Okay. So when you get above what 5.5 kilometers, you're you know. 5,000 meters, about 15,000 feet. Half of the atmosphere is just below that, right? So it's, it's kind of crazy. You have to spread out very thin once you get up pretty high. So that's why it's harder to breathe up there. Now, you also know that temperature goes down as you go up through the troposphere, okay? So as you go up through, and you all know that, right? When you go up in the mountains, it gets cold. Now, in my interest, you know the temperature actually raises again once you get past that point. As it starts to get warmer and once you get to the stratosphere, but we don't need to worry about that. So the troposphere gets cold as you go up. Okay? That's all pretty, you know, that's all stuff that probably you've been exposed to before. And by the way, I think I need to mention here too, maybe I don't know a slide about this. Um, oh gosh, should I read? No, no, this is, this is it. Here. Okay, so, you know, this is actually showing pressure. Sorry, this is showing density, this is showing pressure. So you might know the pressure goes down as you go up into the atmosphere too, okay? So as you go up into the atmosphere, density goes down, pressure goes down, temperature goes down. Okay, that's all you need to say for this, this question. Okay. Just don't answer it like this. Some people answer it one word, down. Well, I don't. I mean, it goes down. I think you get. You know, you have to. You have to explain. So, <laughs> explain a little bit. One sentence. You know, pressure goes down with altitude. Something like that. All right. Now, the change in temperature is very important. Okay. So, temperature. You know, like I said, typically. And by the way, you know, sometimes the temperature can go up when you go. It depends on weather. Sometimes it depends on the weather. Sometimes the temperature can go up when you go up in altitude. But generally speaking, temperature goes down. Okay. Now we call that change in the temperature with altitude the lapse rate. The lapse rate, okay? We call that change in the temperature with altitude the lapse rate. Now, um, Kind of a thing. It, it's hard. It's hard to understand. So I'm gonna try my best to explain this. But if, let's say you got in a weather balloon, you start going up, okay? And as you go up, you keep track of the temperature, okay? And that's the actual, real change in the temperature as you go up into the air, okay? As you go up through the, through the sky. We call that. There's different kinds of lapse rates. We call that the environmental lapse rate. So the environmental lapse rate. AKA the ELR. The ELR is just the change in the temperature with the change in altitude that happens to be prevailing on that specific day at that specific place, right? The ELR, now here's a question for you. Will the ELR, the environmental lapse rate, be the same in the North Pole as it is here? No, because it's going to be different, right? Because the North Pole is different kind of a place than here. And different kind of weather conditions. And probably the temperature does go down, but it's going to be a different change in temperature with altitude. Okay? Will it be the same? Will the ELR be the same in South Texas during the winter as during the summer? Yeah. It's going, everything's going to change because it just depends. The ELR depends on whatever the place is, whatever the day is. Okay? Typically, on average, if we were just going to say a global average, right? Global average is maybe like 6.4 degrees Celsius per thousand years. Okay, 3,000 years. So it's about 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit per thousand. If you want to think in terms of Fahrenheit and stuff. So that's just an you know an average, right? So why does that happen? Why does that happen? Why does it get colder as you go up? A lot of students think this way. They think like 
That makes sense because you're getting closer to the sun. Looks like it should be good. Looks like it should be hotter. Of course, you know, you're getting like, you remember the sun's like 150 million kilometers away, so you're only really getting a wee bit closer to the sun. I guess you are getting closer to the sun, but not very much. Okay, the real reason has to do with this. Has anyone ever used one of these before? Clean your. No, it does. Did you notice what you're asking? Yeah. 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 It does. Air dusters. What, hap what happens? Do you, ever, do you ever do those things? Is it because of the pressure? Yeah. You said, so, somebody, does, some, does anybody have no idea what I'm talking about? Does anybody here have no idea what I'm talking about? Has anyone never used one of these? Somebody, come on. Somebody must have surely not used one of these. I've never used one of them, but I know. Yeah, yeah okay, no, no, no. You've never used one? No, I don't know what they use. Okay, I want, I want, I want you to take it like this and hold it like that. Let it, let it rip. <laughs> so what's it feel like? Cold. Cold, right? And I'm sure, you, I'm sure we've all experienced that, right? You're holding an aerosol, and it's getting cold. Okay. Now I used to think this used to happen all the time because it was the '80s. And my, I was growing up, my sister, she was a teenager in the 80s, and they had like high pressure hairsprays. High, ah, you know, <laughs> my sister, you know, and then I would, I would grab that bottle and I'd be like, oh, you know, cold, you know, really got really cold, you know, and um, it got really cold, and, and I, I wonder why, like, is it getting, like, is it, why is it, why is it getting cold, is it, like, is it, Cold, it, maybe the liquid is cold, or the stuff in there is cold, you know. But but actually, what's happening is the depressurization of the of the of the air. So this is kind of a weird thing about air that we're not used to in our everyday life. But it's one of those kind of crazy things. I could show you why this is with thermodynamics. I'm sure that would probably want to know that. But at when gas when a gas depressurizes, it cools. Okay, when gas depressurizes, it cools. And this is, by the way, how your air conditioner works. You know, it's the same way. It, it, it pressurizes freon gas. It can, you know, condenses it. It's, it's, it's all part of this. So actually, the coldness that you, you get is actually coming from the fact that when you depressurize the gas, it cools. Okay. So um, this is uh, elevation. I don't know if you can see it. Elevation and pressure, right? So as you go up in the atmosphere, it gets less pressure, right? So what's going to happen? As a parcel of air moves up, it's going to depressurize. And when it depressurizes, it cools. Okay? So that's what happens. So, um, and by the way, uh, I don't know if any of you ever like like a bicycle. Like this. Okay? Have you ever pumped up a tire with one of those hand pumps? Maybe you have a hand pump, bicycle pump. You might notice that the, it gets hot. Actually, the opposite happens, it gets hot. And that's because when you're compressing the air in that pump, you're actually heating it up. So the opposite thing occurs. So when you compress air, it heats up. When you decompress air, it cools down. Okay, so that's why it gets hot. That's why it gets cold when you go up into the atmosphere. And that's why it gets hot if you move down into the atmosphere. Okay, so that's the real reason. So as air rises, it decompresses and it cools. Okay? Now, um, this is the thing. We call that rate of cooling, we call that rate of cooling adiabatic lapse rate. Call that rate of cooling the adiabatic lapse rate. So the adiabatic lapse rate is the rate at which air cools with elevation. Okay. The rate at which air will cool with elevation. This is a thermodynamic constant of air. There's only one thing that changes doesn't matter if it's Sunday or Monday, it doesn't matter if you're in the North Pole or if you're in the South Pole, it doesn't matter if what day of the week it is or anything else. The adiabatic lapse rate is always the same because it's a thermodynamic constant of the air. It's like a property of the air. It's almost like the density is a property of the air, right? Or it's, it's just it's a prop it's a property of that of that material. There's only one thing that changes it. And that one thing is the amount of water vapor. Okay? So we have a dry adiabatic lapse rate, we have a wet adiabatic lapse rate. The dry adiabatic lapse rate 
going to cool off like this. So if there's no water vapor, zero water vapor, it will cool off like this. It will go about 10 degrees per thousand years. Okay. So you, and you see what's happening. You see how the gas it starts off small. And then it, it depressurizes, it gets bigger, it depressurizes more, it gets bigger, it depressurizes more, it gets bigger. And it, as, it, as it goes up, it cools. It <coughs> cools at 10 degrees Celsius per thousand meters. That doesn't change under any conditions. So that, that's how it's different than the ELR. Does that make sense? The ELR is just whatever, it's like the weather. The ELR is like the weather factor. It just depends on where you're at, and what's happening with the weather that day. Adiabatic lap rate is not like that. It's a thermodynamic constant at the end. The only thing that changes this rate of cooling is if condensation is occurring co-currently. So if it is condensing while it cools, you're going to get a different lap rate. And we call that the wet adiabatic lap rate. So condensing is when you've reached the you've reached the dew point. It's going to start. It's going to start condensing out its water. It's gotten cold enough to condense out its water, and you're going to start forming clouds. Do you see how the clouds are forming here? Do you notice how the adiabatic lapse rate changes when you start making clouds? Now I have talked about this, and I haven't taught you the reason for this yet, but you have to kind of connect, make the connection. Why would it change when you start? Condensing out the water. Because it's like it's releasing. Yeah. Yeah. It releases it. Yes, exactly. It's it's because there's a release of latent heat of condensation. So as that latent heat of condensation is released, it offsets this adiabatic cooling. So you get different rates of cooling. Clear as mud. It's a very difficult. All right, so as air cools, it rises. As it cools, the water vapor begins to condense and precipitate, right? Once it, once, once water hits, sorry, once air hits the dew point, it will, it will um, start to condense, okay? So once, once air hits the dew point, it'll start to condense out its water, okay? So this is a, this is a graph showing the relationship. How much, how much water can fit into air? How much water can fit into air? Now, how much water can fit into air depends on the temperature. Okay. Do you ever like? Let's say it's a cold, have a cold day like today. Does it ever feel like a cold day like today? Does it ever feel like it's like oppressively muggy? Like, I can breathe. I can't breathe. It's so humid. Does it ever feel like that to you when it's kind of cold like this? Does it ever feel like oppressively muggy? No, it doesn't really. It doesn't, it doesn't really bother. Now, how about when it's like 95 degrees? Can it feel oppressively muggy and like sticky and a lot of water in the air? Okay. Yeah. And the reason is because hot air holds more water than cold air. Okay. So that's why it's always more comfortable, or it's often more comfortable here when it's you know, 50, 60 something degrees. Because this is showing how much water can go into air, dissolve into air, based on temperature. So here's temperature on the bottom. Here's the saturation level. Okay. So air that is 10 degrees Celsius, or probably right now it's you know close, it's maybe closer, like 20 degrees Celsius. Air can hold looks like about 15 grams per kg of water. But if we dump, if we jumped up the temperature, maybe it's a hot day, like it's 90 something degrees, it's about 30 degrees Celsius, you can see that it can hold almost double the amount of water. Right? So that's why it feels oppressively muggy during, you know, when it's hot out in the summer, but it doesn't feel oppressively muggy right now because it's it's too cool. The water can't hold that much water. So the water can't hold that much water. The air can't hold that much water. Okay. So um, this is what happens. The air Let's say that air has 15 degrees per, per gram. 15 degrees, I'm getting all tongue tied. 15 grams per kg of water, okay? 
and let's say that it's 40 degrees Celsius. When it cools down, it's going to hit this point, and that's the saturation point. If it cools down any more than that, that's the, so that's the dew point. If it cools down any more than that, it's going to start condensing out its water. And then when it starts condensing out its water, then that's when you start forming clouds, you start forming fog, and things like that. And then all that needs to happen after that is those little fog droplets. Remember the fog, like I said, the fog and the clouds, they're like teeny weeny little droplets of water. Tiny, tiny, tiny. All that needs to happen after that is some kind of process of coalescence for those droplets to kind of combine and get heavy enough to fall out of the atmosphere. So when that water falls out of the atmosphere, that's precipitation. Okay, does that all kind of make sense? So today we're just sort of learning all of these processes that happen in the atmosphere, and then next time we're going to really learn about what is what's driving the different wind patterns and things like that, driving circulation. So right now we're just learning processes. Does this all make sense? So this okay, point, so point 15 or 15 grams per kg would be 20, right? Right. What would be the dew point for 25 grams per kg of water? Like 25 to 30? It would be about right here, right? So we, so, so maybe it'd be better if I drew. So let's say we let's say we had a parcel of air, we had a thing of air, and it had 25 grams per um, kg of water. Okay. <coughs> That's the dew point temperature. You can see that right there. So it would be yeah, about like 20, what, 29 or something? 28 or something like that. It's pretty hot. Okay, what about, so, so imagine this. Let's say, okay, I'll ask you this. Let's say I had um, a parcel of air and it had 10 grams per kg of water, okay? And that, and that parcel of air is 30 degrees Celsius. Is it going to be condensing? Is it going to condense out? No. It's not going to be condensing, right? Because it's not saturated yet. So it needs to cool. It would need to cool to what temperature? Like 15? Yeah. Yeah, something like that. 12, 15, something like that. It would need to cool to that temperature, which is its dew point, in order to start forming dew, start forming clouds and condensation. When that starts to happen, what's going to happen with heat? Heat will start being released, right? So it's going to release flakes of heat as it condenses. And that's what causes the two different types of lap traces. Okay? Does that make sense, sort of, to everyone? <laughs> it's math, you know. So. Okay. Is there a reason the like rate of change isn't constant? Because it like goes from being pretty, you know, relatively low. To yeah, it, 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 the change is exponentially. That's why it gets so uncomfortable when it gets hot. It gets hot because it, it gets because the amount of water that can fit into the air just goes up. I don't know why though. I don't know why it's like that. Okay, um, this thing is kind of fun. This is a, um, I'll show you this. I'm afraid to touch these. Let's turn one on. This is called a sling psychrometer. And uh, this is what they actually use to, this is what, no, it's not what like professionals use to calculate the humidity. But, um, calculate the humidity from it. So what happens is that you have two thermometers right next to each other. One of them has this little sock, right? You fill up the sock. And what you do is you just get that sock wet. Yeah, you know, kind of to keep the other one um, it doesn't get wet. So you just get that one, you get that sock wet. You get that one sock wet, and so you have a dry bulb and a wet bulb. And what's going to happen is, as I sling this thing, 
Sorry. <laughs> As you swing this thing, what's going to happen is that um, the wet bulb is going to it's going to cool off faster than the dry bulb. And you all know that, right? You get you get out of the shower, and I mean, you cool, you get cold really fast. You know why? It's because all that water is evaporating off of you. And remember, latent heat. So it's taking that latent heat with you. So if this is the thing, if it is so humid in here. That we're at 100% relative humidity. We're at like there can't, like there can't, we can't fit a single molecule more of of um, water into the atmosphere. This wet bulb, it won't. There will be no evaporation, right? Because it can't evaporate because we're at saturation limit. Okay, so it's like a really foggy day, and it's you know it's totally the air is totally saturated. This won't evaporate, and so the difference between this and this will be the same. There'll be no difference. It'll just be the same temperature. But if there's a lot of evaporation. Then the difference will be huge. And so what you do is you swing this around, and swing this, and then uh, who wants to be picked on to read a thermometer? Does anybody want to read a thermometer? Does anybody want to read two, two thermometers? Nobody? Okay, I need one volunteer. I want to swing this forever. And, uh, you just have to read a thermometer. Alright. Uh, you'll do it, Caitlin? Oh, no, okay. No? okay. Can somebody just kind of prove, though, that you're still working? <laughs> okay. Can you see how there's a difference between, between the two temperatures now? You see how the, the sock is, the one with the sock is cooler, right? And so, one, yeah, 160, 170, and then I can just take this thing and it has a little, has a little thing on here to measure, and uh, it sets it down. Oh, there it is. So, I do that, and one, you said 160, 170. Okay, so, I, I just have to match it up and then can read the and it'll, it'll tell you, I mean, you obviously can't see it, but it'll tell you what the relative humidity is. So it's just kind of how you measure. I thought you might want to see that because it's just kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. but I, I actually did this earlier and it was about 50% humidity, which is perfect. That's what we like, 50% humidity. And by the way, when you say 50%, what does that mean, 50%? It means that you, um, you only have half the amount of water in the atmosphere that you could fit into it. So you could, so. You don't have to worry too much about that, but um, it just means that 100% humidity doesn't feel good. Okay, so that's all that. Um, I want to turn that light off again, and I'll show you more. Wait, does anybody see my clicker? There it is. All right, so clouds are microscopic droplets of water that condense when humid air reaches the dew point. And then when all those little droplets are able to coalesce and kind of hit each other and run into each other, and, and uh, eventually they, they can get heavy enough to precipitate and fall out of the atmosphere. Okay? So that's how that all works. Now, another thing we should talk about, um, it's very important for, you know, for weather and for air, you know, air currents and wind is density of air, right? So Cold air sinks, hot air rises, right? Hot air rises because it's less dense. You can see this is the temp this is the density on the y axis, vertical axis on the x axis is temperature. So you see it goes down with increasing temperature. Okay? That's why you have hot air balloons and not cold air balloons. Because if you had a cold air balloon, it would just sit there sadly deflated on the ground, right? It wouldn't, it wouldn't go anywhere. So um, that you know the hot air balloon obviously rises, right? So you all know that. that Hot air rises, okay, and then it'll sink other. So you can even get convective currents inside of your house. So that's convection, right? So it's that circulation of warm, buoyant material and the sinking of the cold, dense material. And even the Earth does that on the ground scale in the mantle, right? The hot materials rise and the cold materials sink. Yeah. So um, convection happens in our atmosphere, happens in the ocean, and happens right there, basically. You know, that's what we did when we started the class, right? It's a little convective cell, water, cold and hot water. And so that's one of the things that really, one of the big processes that causes air to rise and cold air to sink and hot air to rise, right? And of course, when hot air rises, now in the atmosphere, when the hot air rises, as it rises, it will cool. And as it cools, it will condense. And as it condenses, it will cause precipitation, right? So rising air causes precipitation. Sinking air will cause 
things to, to actually get hotter and drier. So you'll see this all. We'll work out more of this stuff as we go on through the class. But. Okay, so convective uh, currents in the atmosphere are created by differences in temperature, right? So differences in temperature over the surface of the Earth. So looking at this map, this is just a map of different surface temperatures, okay? So just looking at this, kind of analyzing it, what are some things, what are some things you think that could affect surface temperature? So what, I mean, it's just everyday stuff. What are things that are going to cause differences in surface temperatures over the, over the Earth? You can see like, latitude. so where is it? Yeah, these latitudes, right? Latitude is one of the obvious ones. Okay, go to the poles, obviously it's cold. You know, go here, it's cold. Um, here in South Texas, it's relatively warm. Right, here we are. So um, latitude's a big one, right? Um, why is it colder? This is a kind of, it's kind of a weird, it's like kind of an obvious thing, but maybe you never thought about this, but like why is it colder in the poles? Like why is it colder in the latitude? Yeah, that's actually almost exactly it. It's, it's less direct, and the key word there, direct sunlight. Because all the sun, all the sunlight that you get at the poles, it's, it's kind of, you're getting it at an angle, you know? So you'll never see the sun directly overhead in the North Pole. Like, you'll never see the sun, like, way up in the sky. It'll always be kind of on the horizon. Okay. And by the way, same thing here. Here in South Texas, you will never see the sun right directly overhead because we are a little bit north of the Tropic of Cam, Capricorn, I can't remember if we're Capricorn, What's the, which one's north, is it Capricorn? Yeah, I can never remember, I think it's, I think it's Capricorn. But we're a little bit, we're a little bit north of the Tropic. We're not too much, we're not too much north. We're, we're subtropical here, right? Because we're, we're just about three degrees north of the Tropic. But look at here, there's some things that are a little bit interesting. So. Look right here in the Andes. Do you notice how right here it's red? But then right here along this belt, it's not red, it's yellow. It's kind of cooler. Why is it cooler right there? That's kind of weird. Because the water. The water? The water's a good guess. Probably has a little bit to do with water. But look over here. That water's hot. Yeah, that water's really hot. So why is it kind of like really yellow right here? We actually mentioned Oh, is it the mountains? The mountains. Right. The mountains. And same thing there in the Himalayas. You see that the blue right there, right? Here, right there in the Rocky Mountains, right? Mm -hmm. See that? So, so there's some things. So elevation plays a big role too, right? So elevation can make differences in temperature over the surface of the Earth, latitude. Um, anything else? What else can what else can change? Another thing that's here is just what is the what the surface type is, right? So you you can see you can see there's differences between the continents and the oceans, right? And that's because and I think we talked about that before. Like remember we talked about like the heat capacity of water and things and like why the water, for example, heats up more slowly than the earth. So all these things. So the, so so there's all these things that affect uh, aspects, different aspects of the land that affect its ability to heat up. Okay, so. So what the what the surface type is that affects that affects it too. So do evaporation like when the evaporation outpaces the precipitation and vice versa does that affect it? Also? Yeah, that affects surface temperatures as well of the water. And you can definitely see things like that going on here. You can see small differences because um, you can see like across the waters. Notice how they're not like perfect. They're not perfect lines. Right, and, and and those imperfections are caused by a couple of things. They're caused by where precipitation and condensation, you know, differences in precipitation evaporation rate. Because remember that changes that 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 um, can move heat around the surface here. They're also caused by currents. So you'll notice that this there's a little blip of cooler water right here. That's the Humboldt current. We'll learn about that next week. There's um, Lips of cooler water along here along the Pacific coast. That's the California current. We'll talk about that next week as well. So things like that. Uh, also, look at this. Look how hot. You ever notice how hot the water is? It gets up to here around even in Scandinavia. Isn't that kind of crazy when you think about it? Look at how hot that water is around Scandinavia. You would think you probably think going into that water, it would be ice cold. Wouldn't you think? Because when you're in Finland, or not Finland, but 
Norway or Sweden or something, you get into the water, you think the ice cold, but it's actually about the same temperature as the water off the coast of California. Isn't that nuts? And is that because of currents? Because of currents. And we'll learn exactly why that is next time. We'll learn exactly. It's actually it's called the Gulf Stream Current. And if it wasn't for the Gulf Stream Current, you will, Europe wouldn't really be a place you'd want to live in. It'd be like Siberia. So it's, it's pretty crazy. We'll learn all that. Yeah. So what causes differences in temperature of the surface? You know, different locations receive different levels of solar radiation. They absorb it differently. And uh, we just talked about all that stuff, right? So there's all sorts of things that affect how much solar radiation you're receiving and how it's distributed. Um, we're going to talk about a few. We'll talk about it really a little bit of it. Now, there are different ways to transfer heat. But the way that the sun transfers heat to Earth is radiation. So I know that sounds like usually when you think of radiation, you think of like X-rays and getting, you know, you think of like a bad thing, like radioactive radiation. But, but radiation is actually any light. Any light shining on you is radiation. Okay. So, so the sun is radiating out its light. And it actually radiates all sorts of light. So this is actually a, a graph showing the um, strength of the different wavelengths of sunlight. And you can see that we happen to see the band of light that is most prominent coming from the sun. And that makes sense because if we saw things in this wavelength, if we saw things in ultraviolet, everything would look dimmer. Because we, you know what I mean? Everything would look dimmer because we'd only be seeing this light right here. So there's a reason that we see the colors that we see. Okay? The reason we see the colors that we see is because that's the brightest, right? Most of the radiation coming from the sun is the rate, kind of radiation we can see. But there's a lot of radiation we can't see. There's so much light in the world we can't see. So much light we can't see. And uh, so we only see, you know, a part of that light. But look at that. So the sun gives off all sorts of things. microwaves, TV rays, shortwave radiant, gives off radio waves. Did you know the sun emits radio waves? Infrared, ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays, everything. All right, so um, some of the other processes that come into effect about you know, how the Earth's surface is heated up. Um, another important thing is something called albedo. Albedo. So albedo is how much sunlight is reflected back into the atmosphere. How much sunlight is reflected back. Do I have a question about Alpita? No, I don't. I'll just kind of, I'll just kind of mention it there and pass and move on then. But it's just how much is absorbed versus reflected. So high albedo areas are areas where the sunlight gets reflected. What are some things that maybe can reflect sunlight? Do you think? It's actually kind of shown on here. But what are some things that can reflect sunlight? Clouds. Yeah, clouds. Also, another one. Uh, think about this: is snow. Snow is very, very powerful at reflecting. Yeah, that's why, like in Alaska, you can have darker windows. Like yeah. you can get your windows more because the light reflects off the. Snow. Yeah, snow. and uh, often people that have trekked a lot through the snow, like in Michigan, you kind of know to do this, but here I would be surprised if you know that no one ever heard of this. But sometimes you need to wear sunglasses mm -hmm. when you're going through the snow, and sometimes people even need to put on sunscreen. Sounds weird. Sun, really? Yeah, but it's because the it's because the sunlight is reflecting off the snow, and it can you can actually get sunburns from. So if it's a sunny day and there's nice fresh falling even surface of snow, a lot of it gets reflected. Has any of you ever been in an aluminum boat on a sunny day? Same thing. It can all that all that gets reflected off sunburn. Okay, so we, I've showed you this slide slide before, but just how you know land absorbs heat at different rates and water, and stuff like that. Um, there's different types of albedo, different places. So you can see that water absorbs a lot of the heat, but um, different places uh, reflect a lot of it. You can see in the poles, a lot of things are reflected off. Why is it, why is a lot of it, uh, why do we have a high albedo in the poles? It's here, it's just not, right? it's just snow in the ice, right? The same thing in Siberia and Canada, and, right? It's snow in the ice. In the Sahara Desert, we actually have a pretty high albedo. Why do you think that is? all the sand because sand is actually just bare sandy soil is actually pretty good at reflecting um, a 
local variation. So um, this is outgoing radiation from the sun. So this is the stuff that gets reflected off from the, from the um, Earth. So this is another thing. Is this is showing the amount of radiation that's coming off of the Earth, reflecting off of the Earth. So it's kind of counterintuitive. Well, no, I guess it makes sense. Yellow, I don't know. I think of yellow as kind of being more like an intermediate thing, but it's OK. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so I was, I was asking, you know, why why does it get colder right in the higher latitudes? Is that a question on this? Yeah. yeah. So why does it get colder? And so it, it really doesn't have to do with, um, I don't know, some people, I actually don't know what most people think about it, but, but um, it does have to do exactly what Caroline said, that it has to do with you're not getting sunlight as directly. So you can see that when the sun is right, overhead at a certain point. See that? See how the rays of sunlight are hitting directly 90 degrees overhead? That's the most direct kind of sunlight. And it'll be, and that's where you're absorbing a lot of solar radiation. But when you go up here to the poles, you see, see how that same beam of light is spread over a larger area. Can you all see that? So you're getting the same amount of radiation, but it has to be spread over a larger area. So you're getting kind of like less radiation per square foot, if that makes sense. So that's why it's actually Colder generally in polar areas. Okay. So um, that brings me to the seasons. That's another thing we have to discuss a little bit of like seasonal variation in, in heating, right? And this is stuff I'm kind of covering for a second time because I, I started the whole class a little bit about this, right? The seasons. So I'll go through this relatively relatively fast. But you know that we are rotating, of course. We're rotating counterclockwise. If you're looking down on the North Pole. We're rotating counterclockwise, okay? So that means we're rotating from the east to the west. Okay? That's why the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And we're also going around the sun in the same direction, right? So if you're looking down at the North Pole, we'd be going around the sun counterclockwise, okay? So um, that's the, we're going in, we're orbiting in something called the plane of the ecliptic. Plane of the ecliptic, or the ecliptic plane. And of course, you know that we have a tilt to our rotational axis relative to the ecliptic plane that's 23.5 degrees. And the fact that we're tilted is what causes those, those seasons. Okay? So as we spin and we rotate around the, around the sun, we're going to be uh, receiving differing levels of direct sunlight during the course of the year. So right now, we're heading closer and closer to the winter solstice, right? We're heading closer to the winter solstice is right around uh, Christmas, that's December 23rd. And uh, we're heading, we're at, and that's the darkest day of the year, right? That's the day where we actually receive the least amount of solar radiation. It's not necessarily the coldest day of the year because of, because of kind of residual heat, but it's the point at which we receive the least amount of solar radiation. So um, also there's this little thing I wanted to talk about. There are some differences between the northern and southern hemisphere in terms of how much heat that they receive. And the reason is because our rotation around the sun is not a perfect circle. So there's actually something called the perihelion and the aphelion. So the aphelion, the Earth is its furthest point from the sun. You might notice that we are furthest from the sun during we're furthest from the sun during our summer here in the northern hemisphere. We're furthest from the sun. So that actually makes our summers a little less intense than the, than, than the summers in, in the southern hemisphere. And that's because we're furthest from the sun during our summer here in the northern hemisphere. On the other hand, in the southern hemisphere, January 3rd, so that's going to be their summer. Right, January 3rd is going to be summer in the, it's winter for us in the northern hemisphere, but in the southern hemisphere is going to be their summer, right? So during their summer, they're closest to the sun. Okay. That's called the, that's called the parakeet. So that makes their summers a little bit worse, a little bit harder, I should say, than our summers, okay? 
So, so that's kind of something that actually causes a difference. So, so we're, it's not we don't have like a perfect distribution, like a perfect equal distribution of solar radiation between north and southern hemisphere. Okay. So um, be very careful because I think this is maybe the same question I gave you before, and again you have to be careful with this because um, I think this is backwards than the diagram that's on your sheet. I think it maybe it is, maybe it's not. Let me, let me see. It is backwards, right? And of course, it's not wrong. It's just that if you imagined yourself on the other side of the sun, everything would be flipped. Okay, so it's just a different perspective. Okay, so when when the axis is pointing, see how the axis is pointing away, right? It's pointing away from the sun. When the axis is pointing directly away from the sun, that is the solstice, winter solstice for us here in the northern hemisphere. Okay, that's December 22nd, 23rd on a leap year. December 22nd, winter solstice. When it's pointing directly at the sun, that's our summer here in the northern hemisphere. Okay, and that's June 21st. Now, when the axis is pointed kind of perpendicular, so this is like the tilt of the axis and the sun's rays are coming in at a 90 degree angle to that tilt, then those are one of the equinoxes. So the last equinox we passed this in September was the autumnal equinox, okay? The autumnal equinox. And then there's the baronal equinox on the other side, okay? So it's really different, different time. Now, during, during the equinoxes, everywhere on Earth gets the same amount of sunlight. Same, or not same amount of sunlight, I shouldn't say that, but it's getting the same length of day. That's what I mean. And during these points, this is a very important point here. I probably should have asked a question about this. I, I neglected to do this. But on the equinoxes, the sun is directly overhead sun is directly overhead the equator. So this would be like an equinox day. The sun is directly overhead the equator. You did ask that. Right? I did? Yeah. Okay, so it's directly overhead on the equator on the, during the equinoxes. But during the solstices, it's directly overhead the tropics. During the summer, during our summer, northern hemisphere summer, it's directly over the Tropic of, I can't remember, Tropic of Capricorn. I can't remember if Capricorn is in. Here we go. Tropic of, no, Tropic of Cancer. There we go. Oh, this is actually a better thing to show. Yeah. So you can see that, so you can see that on the day of our summer, the sun is directly overhead the Tropic of Cancer, 23.5 degrees north. And we are at about 26 degrees north, so we're pretty close, right? So the sun, on, the, on that day, on June 21st, if you look you know, directly overhead at noon, the sun should be pretty close to directly overhead 90 degrees in the sky. Pretty close. It will be about three degrees off. Right? Now, during the during the, the uh, summer in the southern hemisphere, it's going to be directly overhead the Tropic of Capricorn. Okay? So that's how that all that stuff works. Did I answer all the questions about that? Yeah. Okay. Well, what's kind of cool is that, you know, of course, the, the Arctic Circle, 66.5 degrees north and south. Those are, um, you might realize that, again, they didn't just pull that latitude out of thin air. It's 90 degrees minus 23.5, which is the tilt of the axis. So the reason that we have the Arctic circles here is because the Arctic and Antarctic circles, they are the points at which, um, once you get beyond them, you know, so between 66.5 degrees north and 90 degrees north, 66.5 degrees south and 90 degrees south, you're going to get at least one day with no sunshine, at least one. And then, um, and then in the summer, you'll have multiple days in which the sun doesn't go down. At the North Pole, at directly at the North Pole, you will have six months of sun, six months of night. South Pole, same thing, six months of sun, six months of night. 
So it's kind of it's kind of crazy because actually the South Pole. This is kind of a crazy thing. South Pole, North Pole. They actually get on the on the solstices. They get more solar radiation than the equator does. Right? They get more solar radiation than the equator because they have 24 hours of sunlight, and the equator is only getting you know whatever, probably probably like 11 hours. And uh, so I can show this to you here. It's kind of cool. Did I show you this before? Mm. So 77 degrees north, right? So this is within the polar, the polar circle, the Antarctic circle. I hope it worked.